we're in this series where it's like, okay, so if we're going to do these greater works, we're believing that usually it appears the pattern of Scripture seems to be like, like, like there's, a, there's a component and an element of faith that goes along with the greater works. And Jesus, he gives the greater works, and he also gives the faith. But what we're saying is like, how do we join him in that? How do we participate in maybe like growing in our faith? And so we're in a series called Greater Works, Greater Expectations. What does it look like to live with greater expectation that God's actually going to be God? And we've been taking a look at different traits of people who have those, those expectations. And some of the traits have been confidence. Some of them have been perseverance. Uh, some of them have been proximity, like step into the circle. Did anybody step into the circle last week? Like you just get, you got after it with like you got some intimacy. Good? Good. I, maybe, I, maybe that's what I feel this morning. Y'all been in the circle. Because you know in a church setting like this, you can tell, not all the time, but you can tell who kind of comes ready, like, like to get after Jesus because they've been getting after Jesus, or, or, or if that's not really the case. And, and so it just kind of seems like there's a richness this morning that's like, man, let's, let's do this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to believe and hope that it's because we've been stepping in the circle as a church. Today we're going to look at another trait of somebody who is, who is um, they had like these great expectations that God was going to show up. And it's this guy named King Asa, and the trait is preparation. Preparation. Can anybody tell me what today is? It is, well, it is Sunday. Yes. Well, is there a big thing happening today? You're right, Groundhog's Day. It really is Groundhog's Day. I'm not kidding. I didn't even know that. I, I read something about it. Did you know thousands of people? They said thousands of people in, in wherever it is. Puxatani. thank you. They, they're still into this, right? And he, I heard, he, I think it was, uh, maybe it was a thousand. I don't know, whatever. But it was like, I was kind of surprised that people still do this. They, they, they were in the cold. I think it's freezing right here, right? Like, it's cold. <laughs> but I think in Puxatani it's really cold. They were in the cold to see if he saw his shadow. I guess he didn't see his shadow. So that, there's like a little rhyme. I don't know it, but it means that spring, I think, is coming early, right? If I'm right, okay. Um, and then I also went on to read that he's right 40% of the time. So there you go. I don't know what to do with that. But there's also something happening besides Phil. If that's his name, I think it's his name. Or maybe I've just seen the movie Groundhog's Day too many times. I don't know. It's Super Bowl Sunday. How many any Chiefs fans in the house? Okay. Any 49ers fans in the house? Okay. All right. Any Dolphins fans in the house? You're like, oh. We had our time. It is Super Bowl Sunday. So listen, um, Thinking of this idea of preparation, and, and you know, like that's usually probably something that people would get prepared for. I just kind of was like, well, I wonder what Super Bowl preparation is like. And, and guess who came up? So if you're a Patriots fan, you're going to like this. Tom Brady came up, okay? And, um, and, and it gave a little bit about his preparation. I'll just, real, real quick, it says that um, during football season, and then Super Bowl week is obviously no different, he prepares for a game 16 hours a day. You can do the math, there's pretty consistently 24 in every day. 16 of those is spent in preparation, whether it's on the field or in a meeting or watching film or whatever. And um, he's, he's a four-time Super Bowl champ, three-time Super Bowl MVP. Um, had a pretty amazing career. And so it doesn't take too much insight to think, well, it, it seems as though his preparation and his results probably go together. I mean, if you look at somebody who prepares that much, and then you look at kind of the results of that type of lifestyle, it's an easy correlation for you to, to say, okay, it looks like there's an importance on preparation if, if I want to see the kind of results that I'm, that I'm looking for. And maybe, potentially, if I'm not seeing the results that I'm looking for, maybe I should, should back off of looking so much at the final results and start paying a little bit more time to my preparation. Maybe it's my preparation that needs a bit more of a commitment and not just my commitment to a vision of winning four Super Bowls. Six. He's won six Super Bowls? Whoa. 
Puxatani Phil, man. Call me, you know, Pastor Phil, I guess. I'm right 40% of the time, hopefully, hopefully more than that. Okay, six. So even more, the point I'm trying to make, even more. I was thinking, I wonder if we have some Super Bowls that we're involved in right now. Um, I don't know that we always think about this, but, but I mean, what if, what if we thought about the fact that it seems like many of us here, if you are in Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, you, you're playing the Super Bowl of, that, that consists of your relationship with God. That's like a Super Bowl that's happening right now. And, and, and maybe, maybe you don't look at it like that. Maybe you just kind of look at it as like an, another normal like game day. But, but what would change maybe if you actually started thinking about like, man, my relationship with God, that's like a, that's like a Super Bowl I'm participating in. And it probably requires some preparation that I've never thought of before. What about the Super Bowl of your family? That's a Super Bowl you're, you're playing in. I mean, there, there's, there's, a, there's a win and a loss to that after 18 years. We're about to send a, a, a little girl away to, to school. And that, Super Bowl, that one su- area of that Super Bowl is almost kind of coming to a conclusion in some chapters. And What about the Super Bowl of your friends? Or, or the Super Bowl of work? Or the Super Bowl of your relationship with lost people? And seeing them come to faith? I mean, we're, we're actually, whether you look at it like that or not, we're participating in high-level events all the time. And I just wonder if our preparation is matching the level that we've stepped into in all of these areas. And if we're not seeing some of the results that we want to see with the lost or in our family or in our relationship with God, maybe there's a correlation between how we're preparing for those Super Bowls and what we're seeing while we're playing them. Are you following me? Seems as though if we are to raise our expectations, a raise in preparation would probably go with that. Check out this quote by Dallas Willard. He's, he's one of my favorite guys. He, here's what he says about grace, um, lest you think I'm, I'm kind of proposing a works righteousness here. He says grace, and grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. And here's what I mean by that, and here's what he means by that. It's like, you don't, you don't earn God's favor. There's nothing that you can do to receive the simple gospel besides simply turning and receiving it. You don't earn it. It's not about your performance. It's the, the way that hopefully those of you who were baptized are received into this family. We love you not because you've performed some great act. We simply love, love you because of who you are in Christ. And that's the, the Father decides to place his affection on us, not because we've earned it, not because we've put forth some great winning effort, but, but because it's his great pleasure to love us like children. And so that's what grace is. Grace is unmerited, radical favor from God to you through Christ. And here's what Dallas is saying, and this is what we're going to be looking at today. Grace is it's not opposed to effort, though. And what I mean by that is, once you've begun to understand grace more and more and more, there's actually um, a resulting effort that goes along with it. Not to keep it, or earn it, or maintain it, but because of it. Because of your deepening understanding of grace, and how much God has affection for you, how allegiant God is to you, and his glory in you, you, the more you understand that, the more you realize, hey, I actually have a response to this, and, and there's some effort as a result of me understanding God's love that I should be walking in, not earning, but effort, effort. Well, what would that look like um, for us as we start to think about, um, you know, living with greater expectations and, and seeing advancement in some of those Super Bowls uh, that we talked about, and, and even, even with an emphasis on our relationship with the lost as we look at that in Vision 2020. We're going to turn to a guy named Asa, King Asa. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles. Um, so go ahead and open up there. and um, We're going to be uh, working through a passage uh, that talks about uh, when Asa uh, took over. He, he took over uh, reign 
for his father, and he follows a line of kings that didn't do an awesome job. So Asa is known as a reformer. He's one that's coming in to kind of right the ship. He's going he's gonna to try to um, make things better, bring, bring them back to God. And you know, whether you're here, and that's maybe def like definitive of you, you've realized like you, you don't like where things are. I, maybe I named a Super Bowl and you're like, big loss, got to change. And you're looking to make some reformate, you're looking to, to right the ship. Or, or man, you're thriving, but you realize the reason you're thriving is because you live this life of faith and repentance and faith and repentance and God brings up sin and faith and repentance. Whatever it might be. I think Asa has some pretty cool practical ways of preparing that increase his expectations of God that we can learn from as we walk through it. And so the verse that we're going to read here is kind of central to the teaching. And, and here, here's King Asa. Um, he, he's the king of Judah. The nation of Israel had split into two. You got Judah and Israel, and, and, it, and it wasn't unified as it once was. And so he's, uh, he's reigning over Judah, and um, this, is, this is what he has to say to his people. Let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. Keep going, please. We have sought him, and he has given us peace on every side. So they built and prospered. They built and prospers, prospered. And so, and so as I think Asa had a pretty unique perspective on preparation. It seemed like he had a, um, a pretty distinct idea of what it meant to be prepared to prosper and to flourish, not only for himself, but for his people. And as it pertains to Asa and his preparation, it was all about seeking the Lord. Seeking the Lord. You can see that in the passage. It says that it says Asa, he's like, let's go ahead and do this. The land is still ours. Okay, so there was, there was some um, stuff in front of the, the context. It wasn't, you know, just, just necessarily... Um, they weren't necessarily just entering into a, an easy time. There was going to be some effort required, some building. The land is still ours. Let's, let's, let's do some work here. But Asa had great expectations of God because he had prepared for it. He had sought the Lord. So sort of our, our definition of preparation biblically as we look at Asa is, is, is seeking the Lord. What does it mean to prepare to have greater expectations? What does it mean to prepare to begin to win in some of these Super Bowls that we mentioned in our lives today? Well, it means probably a greater focus and commitment to seeking the Lord. You know, it, it, uh, it appeared to me that I love, I, I'm, I'm a, I like vision, and casting vision and like saying things that are like, yeah! It's awesome. And then we're like all psyched up and we leave here. And, and I love that. And so that, that's kind of how God made me. And there's some good things to that. But um, I'm not sure that myself or vision people or, or if you kind of like that, I'm not sure that we always love um, the commitment to prepare for the vision as much as we love the vision itself. Does that make sense? Like I love casting it, but I'm not sure I love all the work that goes into seeing it become a reality. I don't know. That's, that's still, like, I'm, I'm still working that out. And so I think sometimes we can get behind, like, 3% to 6% and seeing the lost get saved. But I'm not sure that we can get behind the commitment to the preparation that goes into that. And that's probably true of your family Super Bowl and your flourishing at work and your relationship with the Lord. We, we want those things, but, but do we want as badly or even more so the preparation that goes into those things. And, and so what we're going to do today is just kind of say, hey, listen, vision guy, let's, let's, let's dial it back a second and let's talk about some of the practical ways that we seek the Lord. What are some of the practical ways that we actually can prepare better as individuals and hopefully uh, a church body? And I think we can learn something from Asa and Tom. Now, I might be the first person in history to ever compare Tom Brady and King Asa. I was kind of psyched to say that. All right, I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, maybe all around the world, churches all around the world are doing this today. But I was like, man, maybe there's something that Asa 
and Tom had that we can certainly lean into and learn from. And I think it's a mentality that they definitely, Tom carried, I don't know, Ace's, all his preparation, but we're going we're gonna to walk through some of the practical steps of it. But, but you know, so, so I might be going out on a little bit of a limb here, but, but it seems like both mindsets, as it prepared, as it, as it pertained to like preparation for what was in front of them, was a, ready, no days off mindset. No days off. Say that with me. Ready? One, two, three. No days off. Now, this time, say it like you mean it. Ready? No days off. It seems as though if you look at Tom and we're going to look at Asa, the mindset behind their preparation was like, hey, I'm all in all the time. Now, to clarify, this doesn't mean that we don't Sabbath, and it doesn't mean that we don't rest, and it doesn't mean that we don't refresh. Actually, doing that is obedience, and it's not taking a day off from following the Lord. That is following the Lord. Probably another sermon there. I'll stick to the one I'm supposed to preach. No days off. Just, like, let's let let that sink in for a second, because we're going to take a look at what that looks like. Again... Right? Because I, I could maybe just preach that for the, for the remaining time and talk to you about how awesome. No days off. Let's get some t-shirts. We, it's time for some new bracelets. Right? Maybe even throw some hats in there. And we'll get no days off. We're going to be a no days off community. It's going to be awesome. Bring the band up. And then it's like, well, but what does it even look like? What does that mean, bro? Like, you're super excited, but how do I, how do, I do that in my minivan Family of four. Oh, we actually don't have any minivan. Oh, no, we, have, we still have one. We have one minivan left. I thought we were minivanless, but we have one minivan. What does it look like in my family of four, four kids, six people, life? What does it look like as a single? What does it look like in my treatment center? What does it look like as a retiree? Well, let's, well, let's take a look at Asa and not just kind of um, throw, throw some things out there. And so um, in your Bibles, Second Chronicles um, chapter 14 We've sort of read our focus verse, and now we're going to look at some of the, some of the passages, or some of the scripture around it. Um, verses 2 through 5. Check this out, because there's a few requirements, if you will, to no days off. There's a few, um, if you're going to be a no days off type of person, there's a few requirements that go, that go into that. Okay, and so, um, and again, if, if like, this is new to you, I, I want to let you know it's not new to Jesus. Jesus never invites anybody into, like, half following him. The invitation for Jesus is never like, ah, step, you know, kind of get your toe in, and then, you know, you can see if you like me or not. We'll, like, date for a while. Here's what Jesus is like. He's like, lose your life, come follow me, and I'll give you life. He never invites us to half measures. It's a good thing, because we know where half measures gets us, right? So what are some of the requirements of no days off. Can we say that one more time? One, two, three. No days off. It might not be the last time we say it. I'm just saying. First requirement. You have a, uh, if you like filling out blanks, here you go. If you don't, just take a note because I feel like if you write stuff down, it's probably a little bit easier to remember. First requirement of no days off. Uh, No days off is going to require, ready, a commitment to destruction. A commitment to destruction. That may not be the, the first place that you think to like camp out in this no days off type thing, but um, a commitment to destruction. Look at verses 2 through 5. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, uh, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandments. He also took out all the cities of Judah, the high places, and the incense altars. And the kingdoms had rest, and the kingdom had rest under him. So you see, Asa, he was on like a destruction tour. He had to take down a ton of stuff. I was reading one of the commentary, I read one commentary, don't think I read a ton. Okay? I read one commentary about this, no false perception here. And, and the commentary said this, um, one of the places that he had to kind of like take down was uh, an, 
like a, a place of idol worship that had um, homosexual prostitution happening. Asa entered into that. In another place, Asa removes, I think it's his grandmother, in like the next chapter from, from her position. She's got to go. And, and so he, he, Asa is going into some like um, very, what we would probably say, difficult territory, and he's taking stuff down. One of his first moves of no days off, this is, you know, not in place of grace, remember? We always want to start with grace. But one of his first moves in, in no days off is that he starts destroying stuff. He starts taking stuff down. Now, please don't think this was easy or he had the full support of everyone he was taking things away from, especially when you start to think of things of the sexual nature because there is a, there's a unique bond that God has created in sexuality that can be very difficult to take away when, it, when, it, when it's not God's design. And so Asa, he's going in. He's seeing, he's, he's, he's doing a, a reality check, and he's saying, if we're going to come back to the Lord, if we're going to seek the Lord, if we're going to prepare, there's certain things that cannot stay anymore. They've got to go. And what, what, would that, what, what would that have required? Because when we think of destruction, sometimes we don't think it necessarily requires um, a ton of skill. It's like if you see a, if you see, um, a destruction team uh, in a house, a demolition team, you, you know, m maybe times you drive by, you're like, I wish I was on that team. Like, I would feel better if I, could, I just got to destroy stuff, you know? And like, but, but, you know, there's actual skill. There's strategy to destroying things. You want to destroy things well. You can't just go in swinging, and so there was skill, there was like strategy. When it comes to destroying things, it's not just like a vision of like, hey, I'm going to destroy things. There's some skill required when we're starting to take stuff down. There's patience required because things don't fall quickly or easily, especially when they're as embedded as what I just mentioned in the sexual nature and fill in the blank, whatever might be there. And there's usually a crew that's required. We don't often take things down by ourselves. We need others to help. So, so we're a church body that wants to see our preparation increase. My question to you today, firstly, is what needs to come down? What is it that needs to be destroyed and no longer live if you're going to be a no days off type of follower of Jesus? As I was looking through this on my, on my own, it appeared to me that um, I've, talked, I've talked with you guys about some of the ways I struggle, um, and I have a particular ongoing struggle um, with anxiousness, and sometimes it's habitual, and God's like doing this, um, just kind of renewing my mind, and it takes time, and, and sometimes I join him, and I'm pretty psyched to do it, and sometimes I, I feel like I take some days off, and I'm just okay with it. And I don't know if I take a full day off, but I take moments off. You know, it'd be like not, if, I'm, if I'm not getting the ball and I'm a wide receiver, I, maybe I don't run my pattern quite as hard as I should because I know I just, I'm taking a play off. The Lord just revealed that to me. He's like, you're, you're not as passionate about taking down some of the idols that you've got going on up here that, that promote your anxiousness as I am, and that needs to change. And so by God's grace, he's changing me. But I needed to realize, man, I have, I have tools. I have ways to fight against this, this stuff that I struggle with. But if I'm not employing them, I'm not really a no days off type of guy in that area. I don't want to live like that. No days off uh, requires, secondly, a vision for flourishing. A vision for flourishing. In this passage, what is he going to do? He's not only taking stuff down, but he's also building stuff, right? He's got gates that are going up. He's got walls. It's as though he believes this is going to be lasting change, not just change for a moment. When you build stuff that protects your cities, it's like, yeah, the enemy's going to come, but we're going to be here. This is our place. This is where we're inhabiting. And so no days off requires a vision for flourishing. Like, like the, the fact that you believe that God can actually bring the change that you're desiring, but we're called to join him in that process. A vision for flourishing. In, in 2 Chronicles 14, 6 and then 7, we see he's, he's building things. He's, again, 
He's adding to the land. It's going to require patience. It's going to require skill because you don't always know what to add, neither do I. And it's going to require a crew. You don't do this alone. That's why we talk about small groups like crazy. Can't, can't do this stuff on your own. You know, Christianity is not a, like an individual sport. So my question, secondly, would be what needs to be added to your life? Not just what needs to be taken away. What, what needs to be brought in to your life? Is it a commitment to getting up early? Is it, is it a commitment to joining a small group? Is it a commitment to going to onboarding and joining a church formally and saying, hey, I'm here. These are going to be my people. It's where I'm going to do life. I don't know. But like, this, is, this isn't like a one-time thing either. These are the patterns of Christian life. So what needs to be added? Thirdly, uh, no days off requires a mindset of desperation. This is not one that's usually super fun, Right? I mean, the destruction's probably not fun either, but, but later in the passage, you can see in 2 Chronicles 14, 11, um, he's going to go out, Asa and his army, his smaller army is going to go out, and they're going to fight um, an Ethiopian army that's, that's larger, it's much larger. And Asa, he does a reality check. So if you're going to be a person of desperation, which is actually a value in the scripture, the gospel values people of desperation. Because God makes his strength perfect in the weak. So if you're going to be that type of person, that's going to be part of your preparation. You're going to need to have a reality check of what's really happening. The enemy that you're really facing. And this is what Asa does. He realizes that he is going to go out and he's going to fight this huge, like, uh, it's, it's like it's on, right? And it's not going to be good unless God shows up. And so what that makes him, it doesn't make him a person of despair, it makes him a person of desperation where he's like, God, okay, I'm going to go, but you got to go. You go, I go. That's his mindset. And Asa knows that if God doesn't go, he's got no shot. That's super healthy. That is a healthy mindset of preparation where you're looking to the Lord and you're saying, God, if If you don't act, I've got no shot, but I'm believing you want to act. So let's go, man. Let's go together. What area of your life do you need to surrender? Watch this, with confidence. I'm not talking about re-surrendering an area that you surrender and then take back because you don't think God's good enough. I'm talking about the area that you need to surrender with confidence and invite God into to be the God of the Bible, not just the God of sort of our own box. Fourthly and lastly, no days off requires a voice of courage. In the next chapter, we, we meet, I don't know exactly how to say his name. I'm going to go with Azariah. Azariah. And Azariah comes to Asa, and he's like, um, you can see it in, the, in your outline there. Please go home and read through these, 15, 7. He's like, take courage and, and basically keep going. And then it says in the very next verse, Asa took courage and kept going. Two weeks ago, I'm sitting in front of Dan Myers, my Azariah. And I don't, I don't know if it was, I, it wasn't like a full pity party, but it was like, it could have been, you know, where you're like on the edge, oh, should we put out the decorations or not? I'm not sure, you know, because I, I can do a decent pity party. And, he, and he, he was just basically in his own way, he looked at me and he was like, you have what you need, you keep going. I'm like, yeah, but where do I put my eyes? He's like, you're looking at the waves and the wind. You put your eyes on Jesus and you keep going. I know the theology of that. I have head knowledge with this thing. Where I fall down is the 12 inches or so between here and here. And I need a voice of courage that is not my own to step in there and say, you, Casey, take courage. You keep going and keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't. No days off. Who's your Azariah, guys? Who's your Azariah? I'm going to close up with this final thought. No days off, it actually starts and lives in one place. Let this verse just wash over you. Throw up the Romans verse, please. 
For those that live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. We can stop there. It's all about a mindset. All these things are are great and good and we can get after them, but listen, you have to remember the battle is not your own. The battle is the Lord's. And what Romans 8 and Paul's writing to us who are in Christ, because that, that, that passage starts with there's no condemnation. Thank you, Allie. Here's one of the practical outworkings of it. Where's your mind, man? Where's your mind going? Because Paul says if you want to live in that, you've got to set it on Jesus. We're going to finish our service in song. I'm going to give our benediction actually right now. I'm going to dismiss all the parents, or at least one of you, to go grab your kids so we can honor the kingdom kids time. And We're going to play the song, and if you have time and you want to worship Jesus in that way, stick around and, and, and sing it and let it, let it be sung over you. Uh, if not, this is our, our formal dismissal. We'll have prayer partners up here if you, if you want to pray as well, but make sure you get your kids and, and then come back. Let us worship over them as well. Let's stand for our benediction and and close. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you if you are in Christ and if you are not in Christ. may May he draw you even in this moment as you sing these words to a living faith in Christ that we may be a no days off people. Amen and amen.